1944, Schrodinger gave a series of lectures at, at uh, Trinity College, Dublin, which he then collected together in a book which he called What is Life? It's a very little thin book. You can still buy it. And the question that he raised was, a, was an obvious question to a physicist like Schrodinger, um, which was that life is completely different from every other type of process in the universe. So in the universe, every single thing uh, normally becomes more chaotic. This, 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 is, a, this is something that was, was described in a, in, a, um, in a law called the second law of thermodynamics. And the, the basis of the th second law of th thermodynamics is a concept called entropy. And entropy um, is a, a, a statistical measure of the thermodynamic probability of a system. I mean, if this sounds a bit complicated, what it means is that if you leave things to their own devices, I mean inanimate things, they're not living things, but inanimate things, bricks or, or, or rocks or um, water or um, sand... Or, or anything really, you throw stuff up, stuff up in the air and it just falls down and, it's, and, it, and it, it, it becomes more random, more chaotic. Um, but life does, and this involves a certain amount of energy then to put it back together again to, the, to, the, to, the, to where it was before, like Humpty Dumpty had a great fall and then he breaks, you know, you, know, you can't put him back together and put him up there without doing something. So that doing something involves energy. Well, what Schrodinger pointed out was that life was capable of doing this. So life reversed entropy. What life was able to do was to take complicated things and chaotic things and to put them back together and make them ordered. So it took disorder and made it ordered. All living systems do that. And of course it's obvious with grown-up living systems like me, you know, because you can look in my laboratory and you'll find that things are, well, reasonably ordered. And, uh, um, well, actually not in my case, but in most people's cases. People have to tidy up. Okay, so if life, if life operates by taking disorder and making it ordered, which it does, then it must have started by taking disorder and making it into order. So the most important question that the human race has ever posed to itself has, 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 has been essentially reduced to how, how, how is it that spontaneously... Out of, out of a huge universe of chaotic molecular stuff, somehow it all came together to produce something that was capable of self-sustaining collection of order. So this, this, is, this, is, this is the essential question, and nobody's answered this question. Of course, of course, the Pope answers this question, and the religious people answer this question, the creation, creationists answer this question by saying that God did this, you see. So, well, that's an answer. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that it doesn't. It, it, it isn't the only possible answer. And, and if it isn't the only possible answer, we can apply Occam's razor and say that God is unnecessary in this area. And so this is, this is what I discovered. Well, I'll, let me explain how it works now. The universe is very cold. The temperature of the universe is minus 273 degrees um, Celsius, zero degrees Kelvin. Very cold. But if you look at life, you find that it occupies a very narrow window between this extreme coldness of the universe and the extraordinary heat of the stars, millions of degrees Celsius. So the planet we live on ha has, has a temperature range which is really quite narrow in, in terms of the, of, of the un universe. But even more narrow than that is the, is, is, is the region in temperature in which life prospers. Uh, if, li if living systems get cold, if they get around four degrees centigrade, um, they, they just stop, they freeze, they die. You know, they, they go into suspended animation. And if they get too hot, the molecular motion is so great that they also die. So you've got this little window. Now, there's a way in which you can convert temperature into energy. It's, it, it uses a probabilistic, a probabilistic... Uh, equation called the Boltzmann equation, and there's a constant called the Boltzmann constant, which is written K, in which you can say where is the energy associated with any particular temperature. And so when you do that, you find that the energy associated with the temperature of life is in the far infrared region of the, of the spectrum. So in other words, it's, it's between about 3 microns and 20 microns wavelength. Now, in order to 
obtain energy to to, to reverse entropy in order to for any any potential living system or, or or anything to obtain energy to reverse entropy and to to take all the complicated chaotic stuff and assemble it you have to have energy now we know the sort of energy that there is where it comes from on the early earth what energy was there there was the solar energy there was energy from radioactivity there was energy potential energy from rocks falling downhill um, geothermal energy a few other types of energy but the main energy of course is from the sun so then the question is how do we get the sun to convert chaos into order from molecules now we know that we do that now this is how this is how we operate the sun he, uh, the sun produces energy through the medium of chlorophyll and that produces plants and we eat the plants or the animals eat the plants and we eat the animals and all that stuff so we're okay with the sun producing the energy that we need to to to, to produce order out of chaos we, that's okay we can do that question is how does a molecule do it now here it gets a little bit technical all molecules vibrate they're like the molecules the atoms are like on springs and they go like this very fast high frequency um, and the, the molecular vibrations are, are characteristic of the particular molecule so if you have a hydrogen chloride molecule or a hydrogen molecule H2 or, or if you have H2O or uh, which is water or you have nitrogen N2 or cyanide which is CN they all have characteristic frequencies because they have different weights they're different masses and so they vib and the strength of the bonds between them is different so they vibrate at different frequencies if you like to think of them they're like a note on a piano although that's an optical frequency but you can think of them like that so for instance hydrogen would be like a lower C on the piano and, and uh, nitrogen would be uh, up a G or something like that it's a, it's, a, it's a useful model now the Sun is broadband so the infrared energy from the vibrations coming in the infrared from the Sun are all across the spectrum so that none there no there's no more of one type of note than the other so it'd be like somebody putting all of their elbow down on the piano and every single note is sounded it would be a horrible cacophony bam you know so that's the Sun so what we need to find is a way in which we select out one of these frequencies to energize some molecule or another and this is not so difficult because it turns out that there are certain primitive um, minerals uh, on the earth which have very characteristic frequencies and in fact this is one of them here we are this is called apatite and this was a common mineral it's calcium phosphate mineral it was present on the early earth so the way, the way in which I believe this works and this, and this is a paper now which I've published it's been published two months ago and part of a book which I published in January 2016 um, is that, that, that there's a little pond and in the little pond at the bottom of the pond are various bits of this appetite calcium phosphate the sun shines on the calcium phosphate and the phos calcium phosphate then releases energy at a specific frequency 1000 wave numbers that frequency is three um, a third of a micron so like a pure note on the piano it'd be La there it is now there are some molecules which contain this same bond in solution that would absorb that energy preferentially and other molecules would not absorb it because they don't have that particular bond you see you can do this experiment on the piano you can press down a note just press it quietly down so it doesn't sound and then you play the same note on on, on your guitar or you sing that same note and there will be a resonance the, 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 the piano will start to make the same sound it will sing it will resonantly react to the note and this is what these molecules are doing so in my theory these molecules then in a sense they they have a, an energy advantage over their surroundings and they can react with their surroundings so they can use their extra energy to react with their surroundings and, and form a new compound which also contains this bond and now you have a way in which you can produce energetic molecules which are more energetic and reactive than their surroundings and so long as the sun shines and produces this pure note pr produces this thousand wave number frequency then these molecules will then continue to eat the dead molecules around them and they will turn into all sorts of different molecules but all of these molecules will have this energy advantage 
Now, of course, the energy advantage is, is all we need in order to, to call in Mr. Darwin and say, OK, some of these will survive and some of them won't survive. Some of them will be more effective and efficient at, at collecting this energy. Some of them will be less effective. And over a long period of time, these molecules will um, polymerize and you'll get really quite long, complicated molecules that all do the same thing. OK, so far, so good. But now let's think about what we've got in our bodies and whether that fits in with this with this idea that it was the appetite uh, the calcium phosphate which which was the initial producer of this infrared energy which created life created living molecules out of dead molecules and the way to do this is to start looking at what sort of things there are in in human beings in, in living systems now uh, on the early earth there are quite a few different um, quite a few different uh, types of material, quite a lots of different minerals. I mean, there were, there were silicates and there were sulfates and there were sulfides um, and, of course, the phosphates um, and, and, and various other things too. But if we look in, in, in creatures, we find, what do we find? We find phosphates. Our teeth are phosphates. Our bones are phosphates. Our DNA is a phosphate. The RNA is a phosphate. The actual molecules which create the energy are, are molecules which have polyphosphate bonds, like adenosine triphosphate, ATP. The standard system of metabolism which occurs in, in our bodies is a function of ATP being converted into ADP. So lots and lots of phosphate bonds, all creating this same note in the infrared. So there we are. That's it. I think that, 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 that the, the evidence is very strong that we are the result of, of a, a development of a sort of molecular life that was based on sunlight converting energy into and uh, converting um, being converted into energy by phosphate and in a way this is no different from sunlight being converted into energy by chlorophyll but of course chlorophyll is a really complicated molecule it take a long time to sort of set that thing up you know you couldn't come along and make one of those just out of a, the kind of thing that you find in the primeval pond in 1952, um, experiments were done in, in, uh, in America by a bloke called Miller, who was working for Harold Urey, who got the Nobel Prize. And what they did was they took a pond, uh, they took a glass globe, and they filled it up with water that contained ammonia and carbon dioxide and, and the sorts of methane, sorts of things you find on the pre primeval Earth. And they heated it all up, and they did electrical sparks and radioactivity and all that kind of stuff. And then they analyzed the content of this after a week or so, and they found all of these molecules. They found the amino acids, they found long-chain um, uh, hydroxylic substances, fatty acids, you know, lots and lots of different building blocks. But the problem was, how do these building blocks assemble themselves into living systems? And this is the answer. This is the answer, in my opinion. So there we are. We have dispensed with God. We don't need him. Although he might be there. Thank you for listening. Oh, oh.